New Testament reading today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or younger, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in the dream to Joseph and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are seeking the child's life are dead. And Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, he will be called a Nazarene. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God be with us this day. May my words be your words, and may we have the courage to live out your message this and every day. Amen. One day while eating breakfast, a woman said to her husband, I see that your neighbor is hanging her wash outside, and I must say the laundry isn't very clean. Obviously she doesn't know how to do the wash correctly. She certainly looks like she hasn't spent much time doing laundry. Maybe somebody should teach her the proper way to wash her clothes, or perhaps she needs to invest in a better grade of laundry soap. The woman's husband kept his mouth shut and his nose buried deeply in his morning paper. Every time the neighbor would hang her wash outside, this woman would make the same criticizing, caustic, and unnecessary comments. After about a month of complaining, the woman noticed something different. Look, she said to her husband, the woman next door has learned how to do her wash properly. It looks so much brighter and fresher and cleaner. Huh, someone must have taught her how to wash her clothes. I wonder who it was. Now at this point, the husband spoke up and he said, I am the responsible part. Well, the wife was incredulous. You, you who doesn't like to be the first out of bed. You, the person who has not done a load of laundry in 34 years of marriage. You, the one who would rather go to the dentist than do household chores. You got up early this morning and taught our neighbor how to wash her clothes. The husband said, no, I got up early this morning and washed your windows. <laughs> Sometimes we all need to have a new outlook and it is important to clean the windows of our lives. I think that this is what a new year can do for us. It gives us a chance to begin again with a clean, fresh, and bright start. I also think that a lot of our choices and the ways that our lives unfold depends upon our perspective. How we view and perceive things goes a long way in how we take care of our families, how we learn and grow, how we develop in our relationship with Christ, and how we are living for God. Because perspective is so crucial to our journey of life, I want to do something a wee bit different this morning. I want to look at our scripture verses today from three different perspectives. 
Three different ways, three different things that happens in the story when the family flees to Egypt. And let's see what each one of them, each one of them <coughs> is to us. Now the first account is pretty straightforward. King Herod was a paranoid man, and he was a master at assassination. In Barclay's commentary, he lists a number of people that met their demise at the hand of King Herod. Here is what Barclay says. When he first sat on the throne, he began to annihilate the Sanhedrin. Then he slaughtered 300 court officers out of hand. He murdered his wife and her mother, Alexandria, and he murdered three of his own <coughs> And in the hours before his death, he ordered the slaughter of the notable men of Jerusalem. This was not a nice fellow. He loved being on the throne and having all the power, and he would get rid of anyone and everyone who got in his way. In Herod's way of thinking, Jesus was a threat to his throne. And like all other threats, he had to be eliminated, no matter the cost. And the sad thing is that Jesus didn't want Herod's throne. Jesus was not, Jesus is not, Jesus will never be king of the world. Jesus wants to be king of our lives. Jesus wants to be king of our hearts. Jesus wants to rule in here. This story in scripture demonstrates that life can be challenging and unbearable, that people's actions and their decisions can adversely affect our own way of life. But it also shows us that in all of life we have God's protection. We have God's guidance. We have God's love. No matter what the world does to us, God is with us. Herod was a vile, selfish, greedy, murderous king who did whatever he wanted with no thought of consequence. His actions caused pain and suffering and death to innocent people. And yet God's plan of Christ in the world was not thwarted. God's angel was in the world helping. God's holy family was safe from harm's way. When Jesus is king in our hearts, we always get God's guidance and protection and we know that in that we are saved. This perspective of the story teaches us that God is always with us and God protects us. Now, the second story gives another perspective. And both the story and the next one I found in Barclay's commentaries. That's where the reference. But these stories, I, I, the reference in Barclay, he lists them. And I, I'm not telling the author because these stories are more legends. There are myths from histories, there are legends that have taken place over time. Now, the first one you probably know. So the Holy Family has been told to flee to Egypt because Herod is out for the baby. And so they're traveling at night, they're going on their way to Egypt. And it's very cold at this time of year. So the family decides to hide in a cave. Get out of the way, to get out of harm's way from the soldiers that are pursuing them. And to go somewhere where it is, they hope it will be warmer than the cold night air. So they go in the cave and they try to get some sleep. And in the cave, there's a spider. And the spider sees that into his cave has entered three people. And when the spider takes a closer look, he notices that this is in fact the Holy Family. And he is in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And the spider wanted to do his part, as I'm sure most spiders do, and wanted to help in any way that he could. So he sees that they're in uh, from the night air and the cold, and the spider decides to spin away up over the entrance of the cave, hopefully taking away some of the cold and wind and making the family warmer. And so he does that. He spins away over the entrance of the cave. Now, unbeknownst to them, as these stories go, the soldiers are arriving and they come to an area where there are caves and there are places where people could hide. And the captain of the guard says, check all these caves and things and make sure that there's no one in there. So the guards get down and they start searching the caves and two guards come up to the cave with the spider web in front of it. And just as they're about to break the web and go inside, the captain of the guard says, you know, Herod wants this done quickly 
He wants this taken care of. We don't have time to search caves that have spider webs over the entrance. If there's a spider web over the entrance of the cave, there's no one inside because they would have to break the web to go in the cave. So leave this one alone. And the legend has it that they did. They didn't search that cave where the Holy Family was. They left it alone. And because of the spider's efforts, the baby Jesus was saved. And the legend goes one step further and says that this is why we get tinsel, or we have tinsel on the Christmas tree. The shimmering tinsel reminds us of that shimmering web and that little spider that did his part for Jesus and the Holy Family. And we put tinsel on the tree to remind us of Jesus and what was done for him. Like I said, that's a legend. You can take that for what it is worth for you in your life, in your journey. But it tells me that the message I can apply to my life in this story is simple. That is simply that that anything I can do, I can do for God. I don't have to be a big captain of industry, a big powerful person. Even the smallest thing that I can do, I can do for God, and God will use that for good in this war. The third story today, or the second legend, um, also a uh, found reference in Martha's book, is about the Holy Family on their journey to Egypt, and they come across a band, so a group, a band of robbers. And as was the practice of a band of robbers in this time, the, the, the method of operation was to come across the Holy Family in order to rob them, was to kill them, take all the possessions they had with them, and then go on their way to the next thing that whatever band of robbers do next. And so the legend of this story goes that the head person in charge of this band of robbers, a very mean, unscrupulous, murderous man himself, took pity on the family and on that baby, and said we will not harm this family or this child. And according to the legend, the man then said uh, a prayer or said up to God, uh, see what I do now, and because of this act, if there's ever a time that I can receive your blessings, please have mercy on me and bless me. And the legend goes that this robber man did meet Jesus again, did meet him many years later, and did receive that mercy. For the legend goes that that man that saved the Holy Family that day was one of the two thieves of the cross. And was the one that asked for mercy and was given forgiveness in his soul. So this story, this legend, applying to my life and our lives again, tells me that everything we do for God, in God's name, in front of God, nothing goes that Christ is working out his purposes in all that we do. And I think that is wonderful, three wonderful things to remember as we get a new year, as we get a new chance to start over, as we get a new beginning. No matter what we do, we get God's protection and love. Everything we do, God can use for God's purposes. And nothing we do ever goes unnoticed. Let us take those three things into the new year and let us serve God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are grateful as always. Be with us this day and give us the courage to go out and serve you.